Welcome back. About a month ago, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton openly warned the International Criminal Court against going ahead with investigations into the U.S. and Israel. He condemned the world body, saying its failure to act in response to earlier chemical weapons attacks was evidence that it was ineffectual in deterring war crimes. The U.S. threatened to arrest and sanction judges and other officials of the International Criminal Court if it moves to charge any American who served in Afghanistan with war crimes. Bolton called the Hague-based body unaccountable and outright dangerous to the United States, Israel and other allies, and said any probe of U.S. service members would be, quote, utterly unfounded, unjustifiable investigation. He promised the U.S. will use any means to protect Americans from the court. The International Criminal Court brings individuals to trial with uh, large-scale political crimes, uh, genocide, war crimes, and then crimes against humanity. The United States is not a party state to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which founded the ICC in 2002 as a permanent international criminal court, but Afghanistan is. The United States government has consistently opposed an international court that could hold U.S. military and political leaders to a uniform global standard of justice. The Clinton administration participated actively in negotiations towards the ICC treaty, seeking Security Council screening of cases. If adopted, it would have enabled the U.S. to veto any dockets it opposed. When other countries refused to agree such an unequal standard of justice, the U.S. campaigned to weaken and undermine the court. The Obama administration is perhaps the only one to have made greater efforts to engage with the ICC. A number of leaders of African countries have had to face the court for war crimes and crimes against humanity, and it appears that much of the ICC's cases have been focused right here on the continent, causing some countries like Burundi to exit ICC, with South Africa well on its way. The court currently has an arrest warrant for Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir, but the continental body, the AU, has promised to never give him up, even if he enters into countries that are signatories to the Rome Statute. So, were the most powerful country in the world out of the ICC, is it fair to compel other countries to observe the Rome Statute? Former ICC prosecutor Charles Adjogon Phillips joins us now. Charles, thank you for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. You're most welcome. Is it fair that many African countries have individuals there facing war crimes and crimes against humanity at the ICC, and then countries such as the United States cannot be held accountable for atrocities committed during wars in other countries? I think the answer to that question um, depends on an understanding of the jurisdiction and the way the ICC functions. And I guess the simple answer to that question is the fact that the ICC is set up, is established to function only where domestic jurisdictions are unwilling or unable to prosecute the crimes, the enumerated crimes you've mentioned by themselves. So its, it's jurisdiction is complementary, absolutely complementary to that of national jurisdiction. The United States is not signatory to the Rome Statute, uh, but it does have veto power in the UN Security Council. It can compel world bodies to take actions against early nations, but the US listens to no one. So. Who keeps the U.S. in check with some of its activities on the international stage? Well, I guess, again, that it goes back to my previous answer. Um, the ICC's jurisdiction is not to override that of national jurisdictions, but rather to complement the national jurisdiction. So it would only be in events that the U.S. is unable or genuinely unwilling to actually prosecute its own soldiers in its own domestic courts that... Um, the ICC's jurisdiction will be triggered. Uh, can the U.S. refer to the ICC as unaccountable, outright dangerous to the United States, Israel, and other allies? And uh, uh, he promised that uh, any probe of U.S. service members would be an utterly unfounded, unjustifiable investigation. Do they have a right to make this threat? Well, in the sense that they have deratified, if you recall the background to it, President Clinton actually signed the the Rome Statute, but never sent it to the U.S. Senate for ratification. Mm -hmm. Then President Bush came in and unsigned the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. And not only did he do that, he actually withdrew support from the court by the U.S. 
and the, the U.S. government was directly hostile to the court by making other countries sign what they call bilateral immunity agreements with the United States, which would ultimately prevent those countries from prosecuting U.S. soldiers involved in atrocities. So the Obama administration then reviewed that and extended cooperation to the court by maintaining an observer status. So the, the reaction of the U.S. government over the last 20 years has been varied depending on which administration is in place. But truth be said, uh, the Americans have actually got 102 countries worldwide to sign agreements with it under Article 98 of the ICC Treaty, which basically uh, makes Americans immune from the jurisdiction of the court. In other words, the U.S. has been campaigning to weaken and undermine the ICC. Well, the ICC, in my, in my view, it doesn't need U.S. help to, to be undermined. I think the, 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 the focus of the court on African countries, uh, whilst atrocities are being committed in the Middle East and in other, in other parts of the world, already weakens the legitimacy of the court anyway, uh, without, with or without American support. Then how does the ICC handle cases relating to crimes committed by U.S. military servicemen or U.S. citizens uh, brought to the attention of the ICC? How does it now handle those cases? You know, if well, it, sim it simply cannot. Oh. It simply cannot because the, the, the American government uh, has put in place what they call the, the U.S. Armed Forces Personnel Act which basically means that you cannot go after U.S. Armed Forces personnel anywhere in the world. Mm. And in addition, they've also got over 100 countries to sign agreements to that effect. So basically, the, the reality of the situation is it, it would be very exceptional, very, very exceptional for a U.S. service personnel to be subjected to the jurisdiction of the ICC. What would the situation then be for countries such as Burundi, who have withdrawn their membership from the ICC, uh, can they still be compelled to face charges there if it is brought against them? If, if yes, those yes, are yes. Um, there, there, there are several ways that cases emerge at the ICC. The prosecutor of the ICC um, can refer a case to the trial chamber. Um, the country can refer it itself. It's a member. But thirdly, and most importantly, the prosecutor can ask the Security Council of the United, uh, of the United Nations to actually authorize the investigation. So in the case of Burundi, which has deratified its membership of the ICC, it will be a Security Council resolution, as was done in the case of Sudan uh, and Darfur, uh, and in the case of Libya as well. So basically, the prosecutor reaches out to the Security Council of the United Nations, and they would then authorize such intervention. You know, you have uh, uh, militants here, uh, the terrorists, I may put it, uh, who should be facing charges at the ICC, but we've never brought that up. Should we also be looking towards prosecuting some of the people who have been perpetrating these acts of violence, these uh, uh, crimes against humanity, to the ICC? Based on the complementary nature of the jurisdiction of the ICC, Nigeria can, by itself, if only it, ra it ratifies the Rome Statute and domesticates it within its own law. In other words, if the Rome Statute and the crime international crimes become domesticated within our own laws, we would then be able to prosecute these sort of atrocities within our own local jurisdiction. How does the ICC then balance the inequality in dealing with signatories and non-signatories to provide justice? Well, again, it goes back to the complementary nature of the court. The court was never, ever, ever designed to be uh, a penal watchdog or, a, or, or a, a permanent criminal court to serve as the world's policeman. It has no law enforcement powers of its own, by the way. And it, 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 it um, relies very heavily, very, very heavily on international cooperation to actually function. And that's one of the drawbacks of this court. It actually relies on the cooperation of member states uh, of the Assembly of State Parties to actually carry out its functions. So the, the, the key word is to, do, to develop international criminal law in domestic jurisdictions so that countries are able to actually prosecute these crimes within their own jurisdictions without the necessity of having to refer them to The Hague, as it were. Charles Adiogo Phillips, thank you for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. Many thanks for having me. That's our time on the program this week. Let us know what you think about Nigeria turning 58 
and our journey into nationhood and membership of the ICC. The address is to reach us on are on your screen. I am Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.